All right. Super, super grateful to see everybody. Welcome, welcome. All right, Dave, I think we could slow fade. Nice job, Dave. Nice job. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, coming here. Lolo, what's happening, brother? Thank you on the check-in. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some more folks that uh, are going to be coming in to this amazing session. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Sun Sam, uh, Regional Director with Big Picture Learning. Uh, super excited to be here. To I'm going to step out of the way in literally less than 60 seconds, but just wanted to share with folks a little bit. Super excited that you're here. Um, in the first time in a long time, K-8 space, we're trying to be super intentional about that and really moving forward as far as networking and amplifying uh, the voices of our K-8 educators, but also just really connecting you guys in really authentic ways so that the work can continue throughout the school year and not just at our conferences. So if you were uh, at the community of practice session with uh, Carrie yesterday, you'll, you'll, you would have met more folks that are super interested in, in the same topic. So super grateful today anyways, and, and what happened the last minute, I'm just gonna give a shout out to the person that I am gonna introduce from the beginning. Y'all say what's up to Denise Lund, um, Who? who's an advisor teacher extraordinaire over at Highland Big Picture. Uh, I wanna give her a shout out because after this incredibly, incredibly complex and daunting year, most teachers are like literally crawling across the finish line. That's exactly when I reached out to Denise and said, hey, you interested in like leading a workshop for K to eight space? Uh, and Carrie was so protective. Carrie's just like, son, they just finished the school year. Give us some time. Um, but I, from the bottom of my heart to uh, Denise, Tracy, and uh, Miss uh, Meritis, um, we're just super grateful that you're coming into this space and, and going to share a little bit of your brilliance with, with the group. So without further ado, I'm going to give it to this incredible um, team from Highland, but I'm going to introduce Denise, who's going to introduce everybody else. Welcome, guys. Thanks, son. Um, so I'm Denise, and this will be my third year at Big Picture, um, and I have the eighth graders this year. Uh, uh, Tracy, would you like to go next? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and son is exactly so right about um, you leading the effort here because you did turn to us maybe a couple days after school ended and then said, hey, I signed up for this. Can you help lead it? I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> yeah. sorry. I'm so sorry. That's all I want to say. I'm sorry. No, it was all, it was all good. It's all good. We, we love it. But I've been at Big Picture um, for, let's see, I've done six years now. I've done uh, three cycles of students. So um, three cycles of seventh and eighth grade. And then Mary Tess. All right. Hello. My name is Mary Tess Batista. This will be my fourth year at Big Picture, my fourth year partnering with Tracy. Um, I came in on an eighth grade year. So I came in like right when kids were leaving and then we started fresh and it was, it's just really exciting after teaching for oh so many years to come into a space where it's no longer about, you know, here's these are the test scores and this is you know what they're supposed to accomplish at the end of the year and it's really like here's where they're at this is what they're passionate about and let's drive them forward and make them and show them that they can make an impact a true impact in their world so it's really exciting to be here in this space and great to have tracy as a partner and denise is a colleague and i saw a few others from big picture uh highline have showed up Yay. so super excited to see them too and amazing, we got to work with Lauren for a little while last this last year. So awesome. Okay, I'm gonna stop talking now. We did wanna start with finding out more information about who's here in the room with us. Um, and Mary Tess and I have been taking a lot of trainings from um, this really amazing um, local uh, person, his name is Peter Donaldson, and he runs the sustainab Sustainability Ambassadors Program. He does a lot of environmental work, That's um, and he loves big picture. I think he, he really wants to be a part of the network. Um, but he he's a former drama um, major, and so he does a lot of, uh, like he's taught us a lot of ideas for how to make Zoom a little bit more interactive. So we're gonna use those. 
those um, techniques that he's taught us. And we are going to ask you to turn your camera for this if you can. I mean, we understand if you can't, but um, to just find out who's here in the room with us. Um, we want you to lean in, like put your face like really dead into the camera. If um, you are already part of a big picture middle school. Of course, if you do that, you can't really see it, can you? We <laughs> can't see who's there. <laughs> okay, and then um, we have, a, what does he call it? Dancing hands, is that right? Dancing hands? I don't remember now. Or maybe jazz, jazz hands. Jazz hands, dancing hands. Um, if you're in a place right now where you're considering starting a middle school, so anyone out there considering it? Okay, very cool. Um, and uh, and then we're gonna have you lean back. <laughs> if um, if you are not an advisor, or um, if if you don't have a, if you're not a, yeah, if you're not an advisor, so maybe you're an administrator, or you're a, um, you're connected to the network in a in another capacity. Okay, very cool. Did I miss any groups? Is there anyone there? It's kind of nice to know who we're talking to. So, okay, um, wonderful. Well, I think I, I get to start this. Um, and I just wanted to say, first of all, that if you don't know, maybe you have, um, you have, uh, you know where Highline Big Picture is, but if you don't, it's um, in a community that's south of Seattle in um, Burien. Like, so if you ever fly to Seattle, you're in our district and we are really a stone's throw away from the airport. <laughs> the airport is constantly interrupting us. <laughs> so the jets are very, very loud. <laughs> um, and and I've been there among all of us who are here, except for Lauren. Lauren really was part of the beginning of the middle school, um, which started back in 2011. That was the, the first group. Um, so it's been there for 10 years. and. Um, and it started really because um, the the people part of big picture noticed that um, students were failing like we had to wait until they were completely disengaged from school as high school students to then find a place like big picture and that just didn't seem right so to to have to develop a place that was um, more engaging and not not take students through this traumatic experience of middle school where you are disengaged um, the middle school started and Lauren I don't know if you want to add anything to that since you're here <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and then one thing that is very new you heard me say that i've taken three cycles of students through seventh and eighth grade, so the sixth grade is brand new our district now. Um, starting in 2019 started sending sixth grade to the middle schools and um, so this will be my first year and Mary Tess also um, our first year taking sixth graders through a three year loop. So, um, and I'm gonna start, I'm gonna share screen and show you our website. And um, Denise has already popped it into the chat. So this is the website that was, um, oh, you're gonna see all my tabs. It's not that bad. <laughs> not that bad right now. I forgot about that. Ooh, but um, no, I can't do it now. That would ruin the presentation. I learned about pulling the tab away and then sharing screen, but I didn't get there this time. Um, so this is our website that uh, Mary Tess really started. I know someone gave me credit for it. I didn't really have anything to do with it. It was all Mary Tess. And then I saw her vision and then I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. I can add to this. Um, but we led a presentation at the little at the little bang at our school um, and and it was really designed to just sort of show the progression of what students experience in middle school at, at, at our school. Um, and it, it kind of gave a foundation for like where they start where we lead them to and how we want to end. Um, so that's what this is it's starting a journey um, i'm going to take you down to this graphic um, and this was developed. Uh, let's see, last summer, um, so at the end of our school year, we all met at a park and um, we hadn't even hired yet for the, like we had an opening for the next school year and we hadn't even gotten to the stage yet where we could hire someone. So we had one of our teachers who came who had actually resigned, <laughs> who helped us with this. Um, but what we did was we we asked this question of, what do we want an, an 
um, a graduate, an eighth grade graduate to be able to do, to know and be able to do. And um, we all, you know, did some quiet think time and wrote lots of notes and then shared them and looked for common patterns. And then um, what you see in these lavender colored teardrops <laughs> are um, the three things that really came out of that. We wanted students to be comfortable with who they are and to be um, accepting of who others are and understand that, know who they are. Um, we wanted them to be healthy and well and make mental health um, a priority and know the steps for um, getting themselves to a healthy place and understanding that um, and value that. And we also wanted them to be empowered, empowered to act, to do things, to step in, to be leaders. Um, one of the things that really drew me to Big Picture originally in my, in my journey was that empowerment that I saw students express. I taught um, 18 years in elementary school and over the last, um, I guess, eight years of that time, six to eight years, I saw that empowerment uh, disappear in my teaching in a way that not in so much in like it was forced on me, you know, where students didn't have choices anymore. And, and I almost left education because of that, because I was being asked to do things that I know wasn't good for kids. And um, when I visited Big Picture, I saw how empowered they were. And, and that's like one of the main things that we really want to see our middle schoolers leave with that that ability to um, to make a positive impact and know that what they do matters. Um, and, and then the, the whitish eggshell color teardrops that you see are how we go about doing that. It's the tools we use. Um, I'm going to start down at the bottom with the we call them ELOs. And you're, you're going to hear us talk about ELOs, and I have to define that for you so you know what we're talking about. It's not the band. from. Um, so I know you might be singing some ELO music at the moment, but um, is experiential learning opportunities is how we define it. And, and what we mean by that is anything where we're going out into the community, where some places call them field trips, we, we wanted to move away from that. Um, but it's not just that, it's also connecting with mentors, it's having guest speakers, it's um, maybe having a seminar or apprenticeship, or um, maybe it's uh, like something that's outside that's really um, separate from like the, I guess the day-to-day -day stuff. Those really special, unique experiences that might be more connected to your passion, but it might also be like your whole class goes to the art museum or whatever it happens to be. Um, exhibitions I know you all know about, so I won't spend too much talking about it, but we showcase, you know, our learning through our exhibitions, but the learning plan is really um, what guides that vision and the goals. Um, let's see, what else am I supposed to say here? I'm looking at my notes. I probably went over time, so I think, yes, no, I'm perfect. I'm perfect. I think that's all I wanted to say, so I'm going to turn it over to Denise, and she's actually going to go into much greater detail about the learning plan. Thank you, Tracy. Um, yes, so I'm gonna talk you through a little bit about what we do with sixth grade. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and in sixth grade, the first two months, um, and we've only done this two times ever, <laughs> um, we focused on building relationships. We didn't have learning plans um, and when we did, the first thing we started off with was teaching the personal qualities competency. Um, because we found out that everything in our middle school world and the structures that the students need kind of lives and dies by their personal qualities. Um, we do have shared advisory goals for quantitative reasoning, communication, but our focus is to take personal qualities and use the vehicle of student hobbies and interests to turn um, those ideas or those interests into goals and teach them SMART goals and then use their personal qualities to make those goals achievable. So on our page under sixth grade, I wanna highlight for you uh, tool that I created. I based it from a life coach school teacher, Corinne Crabtree, and adapted it to make a habit tracker. 
So this is a link and it'll take you to see um, my student Anthony's habit tracker. Um, so what we did was students customized this and put what they wanted to do habitually that they are not doing now. And it's similar to the work of tinyhabits.com. And we started every morning for 10 minutes with this. And then we moved into our advisory circle and community building. But what this did was by reflecting each morning of, did I do things from the day before? It sparked sharing from students about their projects. If they had worked on something um, and they colored in with any color coding that they wanted, then that would remind them of what they thought was new or exciting or things that they wanted to share. It also gave us a plethora of data to analyze. In sixth grade, we need to be proficient in decimals and percents because that is real world adult math. And it also let us compare data and growth measures. So students could see from month to month, what were they getting better at? And they could also say what they felt benchmarks were that were good for them. So we talked about how maybe doing something 80% of the time would be um, something that you're doing well. But we also talked about variability because some things you want to do every day, like sleep, um, the number of hours that you decide to sleep, and some things you don't need to do every day. So our percentages were customized to what students needed. And with sixth grade, it really is a bridge year for students. They're coming out of elementary school. They still stand in lines and rows. They ask permission to use the restroom. Um, and sixth grade projects were a way that we anchored our work. Today, I'm gonna to focus on quantitative reasoning projects because I found in my discussions that some BP educators have difficulty making math look not traditional. Um, so each unit, I decided to create a real connection to apply and expand the skills that they were working on in the curriculum. So the first one we did was a tiny house build. And this is not a novel idea that I came up with. Many educators have used this. But what it fostered for my big picture students was collaboration sharing ideas and troubleshooting around math and scale. So they had a blueprint um, and they could either make their current room or they could get creative and design their dream room. But as an opening project, this really helped build up the community amongst each other. And you'll see in this middle image, uh, students actually once they'd finished their projects, several abandoned their builds and collaborated to build a two-story entire structure, um, which was pretty, pretty fun for them. Um, and the other thing that we did was we took for rates and ratios, and we not only figured out something that we would like to eat, but then we expanded it. So students in small groups, again, fostering that community, had to make a trail mix recipe. Then we had to budget for it. We had to actually gather the money from your small group. Um, and then we took them to the grocery store for the leave to learn with chaperones. <laughs> and they had to make their purchases. And some of them had to make adjustments in the moment because what they planned to buy wasn't available that day or some of them found out the beauty of buy one get one sales and switched their recipes or their ratios while they're in the grocery store. They then taste tested those recipes, got food critiques from their family and from the other students in advisory 
And then we use that as a experience to draw quantitative reasoning from. And they had to figure out how much would it cost to tell, feed the whole entire school district like our nutrition departments have to do. We also did a project where they were using surface area and boxes. We live in the middle of Amazon's headquarters and students are really intrigued and grasped by novel things. Like when you order a tiny thing and it comes in a gigantic box. Um, so we tried to use things that they are experiencing in their community um, or in their homes to give them that novel idea and expand their world. And for math, I don't give my students an end of the unit test. They have to choose something that we've done over the course of that unit to really explain their understanding. And I'm gonna pass it on to Tracy, who's gonna tell you about seventh grade. Okay. Um, I am gonna show you, um, and I'll show you how to find this too. Um, we have so much on this website now that while I was preparing for this, I didn't even know where to find this. <laughs> so um, I'll show you. So you see the seventh grade, right? Oh, I'm already there, so I bet you can't see it. But um, I'm in the seventh grade projects. So if you go down there, we're gonna look at the healthy community. Um, but before I get too far into this, um, I should probably take you back to the moving on, starting the second year. Um, because I think it's really important to just let you know, like, first of all, one thing I forgot to say earlier, um, I tend to do that, I get involved and then I, I say, okay, I need to pass, pass the mic and then I forget to say everything that I meant to say. Um, we don't have all the answers. This is just kind of our best um, guess right now. Like we've been doing this now for 10 years or the school's been around for 10 years in the middle school. Um, and, and I've been there for six years and we've just, we're just like trying, we're, we're kind of refining it and we're finding what works. And this seems to be working, but we don't really have all the answers. We're just willing to share what we've discovered. Um, so this, that, so this is messy and you're going to see a lot here. Um, you're going to see some things that might contradict the other things, um, because it's messy, but I wanted to first tell you that at the start, um, I think what Denise shared is way more advanced than where we were <laughs> um, back when, when I started a first group. And that was like, we needed to find out what students understood about projects. And so it's, I always find this to be really, really fun as like a, a as an assessment of where your students are. And um, just to tell them, okay, yes, big picture is a place where we do projects. Let's do a project, do a project about whatever you want. Let's see what you do. And we just like provide support and guidance and then see what they come up with. And what I find every time they do this is they do what they think I want. And what they think I want is um, like a slideshow, some sort of Google slide or PowerPoint, a report maybe, um, but typically it always involves a little slideshow. So here's a great example. This, this I'm just gonna show this to you and I know I didn't plan to, um, but this is one of the students you're gonna see later. His name is Joe. Um, it's a power, you know, a Google slide. He, we were studying about health um, and he just, he wrote about stress and it's like lots of, lots of words. Um, here's my, my slideshow. Um, and, and so um, we want to break them of that habit of what a project looks like, of what they think a project is supposed to look like. And the other thing that we always see from them is that they, it's a place for them to show us what they already know. So being able to research and learn something new and incorporate that into what you wanna communicate out to an audience, um, that, that is something that they have to be taught. And it's not something that we can just like teach them in a day, it's a process. And it's a process that now we have three years to figure out um, rather than just two. So um, I wanna take you back to the next unit that we did in the seventh grade year, which was, um, what does it mean to have a healthy community? So <laughs> we learned about health and then health for ourselves, for our bodies. And then we're looking at um, 
our healthy communities. And it's, it's really tied into that first graphic that I showed you, the um, identity and um, wellness and empowerment. Because um, as we go out into the community with our ELOs, students are looking at, well, who do I identify with? Where do I see myself in this community? Where am I really from? And um, what's, my, what's my story? How did my people come here? And um, so they're learning all about that. They're learning their own passions. Sometimes we take them on trips and they're not interested. That's also speaking to them and their identity. They know what they don't like and they find out what they do like and what they're interested in. So it's really about like finding your passion with this project. And I'll, I'll open this part up. This is our description um, of the project after we did a whole bunch of ELOs. We met people, we, um, you can see we did spend a lot of time learning about how we handle waste. Um, so we went to the dump, we went to the landfill, we went to the sewage treatment plant, we went to the recycling and saw the this really amazing engineered, uh, it's huge, it's, I would call it a machine, and it is a machine, but it's gigantic, and it, you know, sorts all the recycling, and then we go to the store that turns recycling into handbags and jewelry and and bowls and all you know so they they see this whole process um before that we went to um we learned a lot about our environment and our stakeholders in our community like business the timber industry agriculture recreation and wildlife there's this really great if you're from this area tiger um tiger mountain um, the Mounds to Sound Greenway Trust, they have this really wonderful education program that really speaks to this and learning about your environment and how we can all live together sustainably. Um, and we also learn about, um, let's see, some more about our geography, Puget Sound, um, and uh, what, what we need to, so the science around what we need to do to um, keep everyone healthy, especially as it relates to the sewage treatment, we learned about what can't be taken out of our sewage, and those are the chemicals we put in our water, which impact our fish and our orcas. And, you know, it's just, it's all connected. And, and the rain that falls and what it does on the, on the road and how we've got drainage and it goes into the water. So we learn all about this content. Um, I want to tell you for a moment about an ELO where we were just looking for a place to eat lunch. And um, and is everyone still comfortable with me saying ELO? It just sort of it just falls out of my mouth, but I, it's a trip. <laughs> we go places. Um, but we went to the recycling center, um, which is near Georgetown, and we decided to go to the Hat and Boots um, Park, which I did put a picture down at the very very bottom of this right here. So this is a park. Um, what was so cool about going on this trip to this park, you can't see the hat in this picture, um, but there's, it's a giant cowboy hat from the 70s <laughs> that really got, um, it got moved to this park. We were there and um, there was a man that opened up a door to this boot over here. He got, he went inside the boot and we were like, what are you doing inside the boot? You know, he had a special key and he was just one of the community members that was there to like, take care of the place, just to clean up and take care of it. And um, so he told us about the whole story. He told us the story of um, this park and how the community all came together. And now I need to find that original, here we go. Um, so I, I added, I won't click on this because it'll take you to a YouTube video, but he told us about this video that's 12 minutes long that we then watched when we came back. And it's the story of how this community all came together to save this park or, or to save the hat and boots and create a park and resurrect the yeah resurrect it and it's a really fantastic example of empowerment and communities coming together and making change so it really fit in um we also learned about the duwamish people who are still uh, not it's not a federally recognized tribe in in our area um, and their building of the longhouse we also studied about the people who are without homes, who are um, experiencing um, homelessness. And, and cause this was at a time um, when just, it was skyrocketing. We were seeing tense, tense city all over the place in our community. It was the third highest homeless population in the nation in Seattle. 
Um, and lots of students, when we go on ELOs, they would see that and they would ask questions and they would give their lunches to people who, who um, appeared to be without a home. Um, and and so so we're building that we're building that empowerment as we go places and ask questions. Um, and, and at the same time, we're asking, well, what does it mean to have a healthy community? So um, so that's that's really what this this whole study was about. Um, but what I wanted to make sure you knew was our requirement and our requirement was that you could not make a PowerPoint or a Google slideshow. So, and I still remember the looks on the faces of the students who are like, wait, what? I can't make a Google slideshow, but isn't that what you want from me? <laughs> so so um, we asked them to have three products and the three products were um, a flyer that, that gave um, three to five suggestions of what you could do around, um, and it, they had to choose a topic around the community. And um, like, if you were interested in, in some, some way, some aspect that um, a community can be healthy. So some students chose homelessness and some students chose waste, or they chose a whole bunch of different topics. Um, but they needed to make a flyer with three to five suggestions and they needed to at least do them or make a plan to start doing them. They needed to have a QR visual. So building off of what Denise just shared with us, um, it's really hard sometimes for students to really um, make sense of uh, quantitative reasoning outside of like a math book or math lessons in class. And we wanted them to see where um, you needed to reason quantitatively to make sense of like the health of your community and what you needed to do. So look at look at the rates. I remember when we were doing that, when we were studying about the homelessness in the Seattle area, they noticed that so many of them were veterans. Um, and so that that led students down this path of trying to find out more about what was going on. Um, and then the third product that they needed to create was a letter. They needed to write a letter to a community member or a, a community leader. So they needed to take an action and, and make a suggestion um, on what, what to do. So I need to go back up here. Um, I am going to show you really quickly this thing. Um, this one over here, oops, I scroll up a sec. You'll be able to see like all of um, this is the rubric and the checklist that we give to them in advance. Um, and you can see that they're they're scored on, like they're evaluated, I won't say scored, but they're evaluated on four things, those three products and their presentation. So they needed to make a 10 minute presentation. Um, but here's what I wanna show you over here. So we've got three students, um, Jack, Sandra, and Joe, and their product pieces. And every one of them, you're gonna see um, my feedback to them. So, um, but you can see Jack, Jack has like a really simple, Jack is his identity, he's a skater. He loves to skate. So he wanted to suggest making a skate park in Des Moines and in, in the community where he lives. Um, Highline is made up of a lot of different um, cities in a sense, towns. Um, so he lives in Des Moines, which is not too far away. And he counted up all the skate parks. So pretty simple, pretty basic. Um, and then he made a flyer to, and I think, you know, this is back in 2017, I think we might turn that into some sort of meme or a social, something that could be posted on social media. Um, but, and his flyer is pretty basic. Um, and then we go on to, let's see, Sandra, Sandra's over here. And I'm sorry, I should probably, I, I don't mean to speak poorly of, of, of Jack. He does this amazing thing, and later on, you'll get to see Sandra, Jack, and Joe's work as in the, like as graduating eighth graders. They do their independent projects, and we have all of their work up there too. So it's really incredible. Um, but you can see he just makes this, this flyer, you know, build some skate parks. Um, you know, <laughs> it's not really it's it's you know it's beginning. And so what I love is that you're not going to see like stellar project work. It's just like the beginnings of having to see where they are and to help shape it. And every time we just shape it a little bit more and they learn from it and they explore their passions and and they really they really grow from it. Um, let's see, Jack, uh, sorry, no, Sandra's next. So Sandra was really interested 
in health. She wants to go into the medical field. So she was really interested in how the Duwamish, the river that runs through um, Seattle, it is um, highly polluted. It used to be a super fun site. Um, it, it, and, and that has dramatically changed over the years. But I want to show you this. This is gonna. Um, this is her graphic, her QR um, visual that we asked them all to create, and um, you can see what she did with the 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 bars down here. So I know my screen is not showing you um, what is down here, and for some reason it's not letting me. Hold on. Why can't I scroll down further? Oh, I guess that's it. So you can see it. I just can't. Um, <laughs> so this is the amount of. She called it. You can read her her um i can't remember what it's called it's like acid dip is what she called it um but how much was put into the river and it that's not happening in 2018. um she was projecting what she expected to see she did some interesting math problem to make a projection if nothing had happened um if no if there weren't a super fun site if there weren't rules and regulations that had been employed um, since 1945. So 1945, the river was in a real horrible state. So she made these projections of what it would be. And she used the actual years as bars. <laughs> so like lots of problems with this, but it is a great starting place for learning. Um, so let's see. And then she writes, she makes this really beautiful flyer. And what's really cool about her presentation is that she doesn't put this anywhere um, in her work, but she tells us, and, and it makes sense, she tells us the story of how her family um, had to leave El Salvador because of a volcano. And that's how she came to the United States. That's how her family came to the United States. Um, so she really identified with what the community had gone through in the Duwamish area because of what her family had gone through. And she told that story at the beginning. And then this is her, her flyer. Um, let's see. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about what's in her work. I want to show you her letter to the mayor. And the letter to the mayor is really funny. Um, I, I mean, you can see her passion. Um, she is like telling Jenny Durkin to do all kinds of important things to help save the Duwamish. And what's really interesting is that the community of the Duwamish have done so much. They're actually having celebrations about the work that they've done. <laughs> um, and so it really is a, a, you know, an opportunity for students to see, oh, I need to step back just a moment and really research and understand what people have already done and where, how can I fit into that? How can I be a part? How can I really make an impact? Um, what's interesting about all of these projects, and I didn't show you Joe's, um, but what's interesting about all of them is that they all show identity. Like you can all see them really engage in their identities. Um, Joe, who I didn't talk about, really becomes passionate about waste and recycling. He, he makes a visual, and you can click on all of these um, and see for yourself. He, he projects how much we would save if we recycled versus if we just continued throwing things out. Um, so they all really explore that. They, um, they're, they're learning about research. They're learning about how to make sense of the content they're learning. They have got work to do. <laughs> they don't fully understand it all, but, but it's, it's a really great start. Um, the one area that I think is the weakest is the empowerment. And, and what you can see is like, when you look at Jax, he doesn't have a letter. He never, he wrote, he read a letter to us, but he wouldn't give it to me. I couldn't, I never laid eyes on it and he didn't send it. <laughs> um, with, uh, with Sandra, she wrote this letter, but she knew that she knew she was bullshitting. Like she didn't do the research. She just put a lot of, you know, her passion into it, but she didn't have the research. And so she didn't send it to the mayor. Um, and then when you look at Joe's, he wrote a really great letter, but he never finished it. And that, that letter never got sent to the mayor of SeaTac. And so what I think what I'm hypothesizing here is um, that they're, you know, it's a process and they're not there yet. And we don't expect them to be, but we're, I think to get there, they need to have these moments of, oh, this is just a, this is how we can start to do that. This, this is an idea that I can start to grapple with. 
Um, so it's, it's, it's really fun to watch. And then Mary Tess is going to talk about where, um, where they, they get even better at this. <laughs> oh, I think I've put the wrong thing in there. Never mind. Uh, I unmute it later. I'm going to click that. All right. So I jumped in to big picture middle school when kids were coming in the eighth grade. And the kids who'd been there for a while had had Tracy's influence already. Like you saw a picture of them at the hat and boot place. And then we got some new kids who, you know, they were disillusioned with school, even more so than the kids who started right away. How many of you have, give me some hand dance if you know these kids. These are the kids who are like, well, I can't do birds flying overhead, but these are the kids who are like, no, school is not my happy place. It is not where I feel successful. And so you've got to get them excited and you've got to show them that what they're fully capable of, because it's not just that school itself sucks. Their, their self-worth in a school setting is low. Um, and so I'm going to share screen for just a sec. So we've got to, we've got to get them excited. Get them excited about what they can do. This Models of Excellence place right here has really deep, meaningful um, examples of actual student work that spans K-8. Uh, and I steal from them often to get kids excited. So for this first part is just taking an object that they use every day. One kid picked um picked a football or a soccer ball i mean because that's what he plays he plays soccer he wanted to be a pro soccer player all right great so let's break it apart let's see who invented it let's see why it's important let's see you know where you could go with this what are all the pieces that are involved with this just expanding where they're at and then let's take something fun talking about building on that qr and trying to find places tracy is the queen of like oh you're passionate about that oh you've got a subject please, let's go here. Let's do this. Let's go out and find something else in the community. I'm just going to take you on public transportation and we're going to figure it out. And I'm panicking over here. I'm pit sweating because I'm like, oh my God, Tracy, I'm so going to get lost. And she's like, no, no, we got this. And so we do these great, um, these great outside trips, but we also do these great inside trips and we use math all the time and it's just about getting them to feel successful. So the kids were stealing or they weren't stealing, they were taking um, old boxes from out of the recycling bin next to the cafeteria and they were sliding down the hill at lunchtime. You know, they're having fun. So it's like, all right, you wanna do that? Let's see who can make the fastest sled down this hill. We're gonna make it a class project. We're gonna learn about speed. We're gonna learn, you know, how to calculate that. We're gonna learn about friction. We brought in people um, and it was great but it's all about getting them reinvested and excited again about learning and expanding where they could be. And then once they're excited and they're invested, then let's say, let's take your passions. Let's take what you are excited about and let's show you that you are important and you can make an impact. You, you know, the year that I got on with Big Picture was a really, really sad year for our resident orcas. Um, I forget who in the J-Pod had just lost her child and she carried her child around for so many days, 15, 23, it was a crazy number. And I just saw it on a Disney um, show about whales. I was like, Corey, look, that's my husband's name. Corey, look, that's our, that, those are our orcas. Look at that mama, she's carrying around her baby. They care so much. And of course you're dealing with some, some people who are like, why do I care? I don't wanna be a biologist. I don't wanna be a marine biologist. I have no interest in animals whatsoever. But going back to, uh, going, going back to what Tracy was sharing and I can't remember, Jack, Jack totally went into, I wanna make my own clothing line. I want to, um, I want to put spikes on hoodies and, you know, paint my logo all over everything. It's like, all right, well then how are the, how is the clothing industry impacting our resident orcas? How is what, you know, how, how is the car industry impacting our resident orcas? How is the makeup industry impacting our resident orcas? How is the food industry impacting our resident orcas? And so we, we got them to see that it is all connected. Like we, like we mentioned before, somebody made that, um, 
that comment in the chat that everything is connected. You have a passion and your passion has a place. So finding those relevant problems and then figuring out what is somebody else doing about it? Because you're still small. I'm still small. Like I'm one person and we are billions. So who else is already working on this project or who else is working on something that is important to us? Team up with them and make your impact. That's what this is. It's an impact project. How can I do something of meaning with what I am passionate about, with what I am interested in? And then we did, again, building in that QR, how can you measure your impact? How do you know that what you did had an effect? If you did a beach cleanup because you like to just go on a walk and hang out with your friends and you know pick up some trash, great. How many pounds of trash did you pick up off the beach? And then think how many pounds of trash wash up on the beach? So what was the percentage of your impact? What more could you do? And then, once we went through this, I feel like we're rushing everybody through this. Are there questions? Should I pause? Would that be helpful? No, nope. super quiet. Okay. It's because it's Let so awesome. We're just all like, wow. <laughs> Thanks, Heidi. Coffee right here in my Orca mug. That helps. So does nervous, you know, nervous energy is great. All right, so then I'll go back to sharing. Mm -hmm. And again, I, it was thanks to sustainability ambassadors, Tracy made me go to another Peter, Peter Donaldson thing. And it really makes sense. And it's great to see the community pull together around, um, around that. And so I am, there we go. Okay. So once they created an impact project and you know you all have the link so you can go in deep for all of these, uh, Jack was toxins in clothing, Joe, um, Joe was eventually trying to build a rain garden at school to, har to harvest what we had and to apply it to our community, which was really important to him. And Sandra was all about the science of it, like what's going on. Okay, so they had an impact project. And then once they measured their own impact, then it was, how can you get somebody else to piggyback off what you're doing? How can you take your makeup line? I had um, one student who was all about 2 a.m. makeup videos and stuffed Nutella chocolate cook, chocolate chip cookies, which were the bomb. But anyhow, but it was, how do you get somebody else to understand what you're doing and why it's important and kind of go along with you? So the influence project is what followed with that. So Joe, um, Joe, again, all about his community. But in this case, he went a different route. He didn't stick with the orcas. He had had a loss in his life and he wanted to see, um, he wanted to go more in depth with death and with loss and figuring out how can we make people's lives enjoyable and more meaningful. And so he went out and he, he did a survey, he interviewed different people. And again, it's connecting with the community. It's taking what you're passionate about and what you're interested in and saying, all right, figure out, um, figure out how it fits, figure out how it's connected to what other people are doing and what other people need. And, and that's what the direction he went. And it was fantastic. Now, what's funny about Joe is that after this influence project and dealing, being able to work through some of the grief in his life, in his personal life, he switched back and he went back to that rain garden. He's like, I handled, I handled my business. I figured out what I needed. I took care of it. I used this learning cycle to say, I need to take a step back and deal with me and use that me time to then also share in case somebody else needed that. And now I'm gonna go back to my community piece. Ooh, I see something in the chat. Oh, thank you, Denise, for putting the sustainability ambassadors in there. And then I, I'm gonna close the chat because I can't see. And then 
We went right back to Joe and he did those calculations. Again, that's that QR, it's that how does math fit in everything we do? Because it does, it's so important. Sorry, I'm slightly distracted. There's some arguing going on. I do have three little boys and now they're screaming at each other in the living room. My husband's gonna step in in a sec, but for the moment, I am distracted, I apologize. All right, and I have to say, Jack went back to his toxins and clothing. Again, he abandoned his skater project, except that he switched it to being skater clothing. Like he's, he's still a skater, that's never gonna change. We still ski, see him skate by our our classroom windows all the time it's like oh my goodness pick up your board while you're on campus unless you're in your seminar uh but no but this is so cool like this is a picture of him with you know clothes that he's adapted that he's sewn on um he's sewn on super big some of them had really big spikes he aged them he distressed them he painted them and he reached out to other people. He reached out to mentors. And that's really what we're trying to do in the eighth grade. It's like, take your passion and connect to the community. We're going to take what you're interested in and we're going to find somebody or you're going to find somebody. I am not always going to find somebody, um, but you're going to reach out to these circles and these circles are going to lead you in directions that are either going to deepen your passion or are going to show you that, mm, I think I might want to go a different direction. And that is wonderful because then it's like, all right, you explored that. You thought you were totally into that. You wanted to design skate parks, but now that's not really your thing. You still want to skate in them, but that's not where your interests really lie. They lie in the logo. They lie in the brand name. And you are going to make a difference in your community with something that is important to you. And then eighth grade culminating project, they get to do whatever they want. But our requirements are that you have interactions with mentors. You have to email them. You have to call them. You have to set up an interview at some point. And, and we tell the families too, that's another important piece that we're, we send out the, just like if you're going to start a college course, or you're going to start a big project here is the course syllabus, here are the requirements, here is a letter to the family. So when your child says, oh no, I have a project too and I haven't done anything, you know, it's up to the family. Do you wanna help them the whole way through or do you wanna say, you know, this is a life lesson. And right now I'll help you next time through, but because where you fell down, but you waited until the night before to tell me that you needed X, Y, Z for tomorrow. My children are already doing that and I'm like, yeah, it's going to kind of stink today for you. My oldest is nine. He's learning the lessons early. And that's okay. It doesn't mean that, you know, we just support them in different ways. And let's see. I think I'm out of time. Tracy, am I out? I'm looking back at. Yes, because four minutes ago, I was supposed to pass the baton to Denise. So I get excited and then I talk too much. And so I'm going to stop talking now. Thank you, Mary Tess. Um, the last part that we wanted to reiterate for you is dig deep and ask about the true requirements that your school leaders have for you. When we dug deep, we were only required to teach PE and health and our state's history. So you may have less limits than you think of what has to happen in middle school that ends up on a graduation transcript. Um, and use your communities to ground your work. Um, one practice was to teach ancient civilizations in the sixth grade. I didn't teach European civilizations. I taught ancient North American and South American civilizations because we have students from Mesoamerica. And so, Think about ways where you can decolonize the curriculum and place the students that are in front of you inside what you're doing in the classroom. Uh, we also took an approach that wellness is a whole. Middle schoolers, part of what you should learn in PE and health is sleep and nutrition and 
habits that keep you moving that are fun. I had one student um, who set a choreography goal this year, dancing to K-pop because she hated working out and getting sweaty. Well, guess what happened when they were doing their K-pop choreography? They got their fitness in and their cardio. Um, so we just hope that um, you uh, got a lot of ideas of how something in your community could um, happen for your K-8 students. And um, we always um, welcome uh, questions or feedback, but at this point, we'd like to open it up for questions from anybody. Hi there. Um, I just have a quick question. I've never been to Highline, unfortunately. Um, so is your middle school in the same building or in the same property as the high school? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So You're welcome to come visit. We I don't get to, visitors. <laughs> our, many staff from our building have visited. I've just never been one of those lucky ones. So um, one day, one day. Um, well, the high schoolers, the high school people come and tour and then they never see our middle school classroom. So oh. we're open to middle schoolers. Yeah. Uh, well, and that's what I was wondering. I'm about to be a 401 advisor. So then I'm going to loop down to 101's freshman. And so um, I plan to, Kate, she's on here. She's going to be our eighth grade advisor. This will be our first year of a middle school program. And so I was just wondering, like, how have you guys uh, collaborated with the 101 or freshman level and the high school level with your eighth graders to kind of help bridge the two programs? Um, well, I know, Denise, you've done a lot of that. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll start and then send it to you. Um, right now, um, as, as we just ended with a group of eighth grade, um, like we, what I've done is um, the, the 301s, they have been really instrumental in helping the eight the eighth graders make that transition to high school. So um, one way we do that is by going to each other's exhibitions. I think that's really really important. And um, and we we get them doing that pretty early on. Go see um, a high schooler do their exhibition just to see what it is, and it's pretty intimidating, especially when you know we tell them be prepared to. Um, give feedback. You you will be expected to give feedback, and they don't really hear. Like, middle schoolers only hear like ten percent of what you're saying anyway. Um, so then when they're they're on the spot um, having to do that, it can be kind of scary for them. Um, but they get used to it. So I think exhibitions and it's really powerful powerful for the um, high schoolers to come to middle school exhibitions. I remember one of our most immature students. Um, who just graduated from eighth grade, his mom was floored when she saw how he responded to it at his exhibition. The, and I know it was because the high schoolers were there. Like it brought something out in him that nobody saw ever. <laughs> so it was like a first time. So that is one thing. Um, the other thing that, that we've been doing with the eighth grade um, 301 connection is um, Angie is, I'm thinking about Angie because she's our 301 advisor and she and I put this together. Um, like they sent um, the eighth graders letters in the mail to welcome them. Um, and and then the other thing that we, we had um, a session where we all come together and just ask some questions about high school, just like, you know, they all understood what it was like. They, they know what it's like to be a middle schooler. What do they need to know going into high school? I know that's really late in the game, um, but Denise uh, started thinking about this way earlier. So I want to pass it off to Denise. <laughs> Denise, real quick, and I just, uh, just for clarification, just, just in case folks don't know, 101, 201, 301, 401. 101 is ninth graders, 201 is 10th graders, 301 is 11th graders, 401 is the seniors. Just, uh, <clears throat> it's a secret society. All we ask is trust. These codes are, these codes are real, okay? A lot to add to Tracy's. Um, one thing we mentioned earlier in the presentation was we thought about what we wanted an eighth grader to be able to do or the skills um, and how we could make identity, um, wellness, and empowerment um, get them those experiences and those successes during their middle school time. So one thing that um, the eighth graders do is 
we are not trying to just exist to prepare them for the high school. We see the middle school experience as having its own traditions and benchmarks. Um, but what I did this past year was I just asked the ninth graders who had just left, um, what do you wish you would, had experienced in eighth grade to help you make a smoother transition? And the biggest one was the empowerment part of reaching out and doing cold contacts and interviewing. And so just finding those um, bravery skills where the middle schoolers are going out of their comfort zone indirectly prepares them for middle or from the transition to high school. I have a question um, like, um, Christy was saying, we're going to be brand new. So like the eighth graders that I'm having, they, they are coming from traditional schools. Um, I'm anticipating them to have some pretty big walls built up as far as education goes and being in the school goes. Um, what do you think like is the number one thing that I should start with? I mean, I know building relationships is important, but like what is the one thing that I should start with? Because I'm feeling really overwhelmed right now. <laughs> um, I would say that for sixth graders and for seventh graders, we did pieces that felt important to connect them to their identity. And that was a vehicle for us to learn more and build those relationships. Um, I had them interview a family member to get a historical story. Um, the sixth grade group this year did an awesome project where um, I think it was called 13 Things I Can Do or I Can Make. And they all made something and then taught the class how to do it. Um, Heidi can jump in and give some more details about that. But um, just getting them to work together in any kind of team building, like we did the math tiny houses, any activities where they can start to see themselves as a group um, and explore their own identities. Thank you. Um, that was actually the idea that we actually had. So Deanna is on here as well. She'll be the sixth grade teacher. I'll be the eighth grade teacher and then Donna will be our seventh grade teacher. Um, and that was actually the idea that we had. We were going to start with like a cultural history, like who they are and what's their connection to the community here in Napa, Idaho. Um, that's what we were going to start with. So that helps. Thank you. And Kate, will your students then move on to a big picture high school? So we are going to be in the same building as the big picture high school. So yeah, they will. And then Christy um, is with the seniors and her and I have been talking a lot about her coming into my classroom um, and building relationships with those with those eighth graders already um, before they move on to the was it 101? 101. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. You're, you're right. <laughs> I want to give uh, Lauren an opportunity. Lauren, you want to chime in real quick what you wrote? Uh, chime in to pass it to Denise. <laughs> OK. I'm going to pass it to Tracy because I didn't do home visits. Oh, I, I think I missed that, home visits. Um, Hold on just a sec. Let me say something before I, I oh, yeah, to do soon. In the ideal world, I'd start with home visits. I did do that. And it is really super powerful and very time consuming. I hope that you can. You get support for that, but it's really, really worth it. Um, I was going to say that I think what's true about the beginning year, your first year in any big picture, whatever level you're in, there's a lot of unschooling that needs to happen. And um, that's one of the reasons why we started with like, what? Do, let's do a project. Let's see what you do with the project just so they can get their hands dirty and you can see what they think a project is and then um, unteach unschool that and help help them see uh, what what we mean when we say explore your passion and do a project. 
Um, but yeah, I would also reiterate all of the community building, relationship building. I don't think there's any like sixth grade level, seventh grade level, eighth grade level version of that. It's it's just dig, you know, get in there and build relationships. I have a question about Tracy, what you just mentioned about um, starting off with like, do a project that you're passionate about, because I feel like one thing that I'm working on is not over scaffolding. Um, because once I see student frustration, I'm like, okay, here's the template and here are like 10 ideas. And so, um, but also like knowing, I think someone mentioned this earlier that the when students c c uh, come in, they can have a lot of school frustration or disenchantment with school. So then when presented with like an open-ended challenging task, there can be like immediate shutdown. So how do you launch this open-ended passion project in a way where students feel successful um, and also like that they can do it in a way that the teacher isn't like trying to over scaffold? Asking for a friend. Oh, that's such a great question. Um, well. So I, I guess I would say um, one thing that I've discovered, and I think I learned this during the pandemic, and we didn't do that open project. We pretty much, I mean, we, in a sense, we did without really that intent, because um, because we just didn't have the time with them to be able to scaffold in in large amounts. So we were really just accepting of everything. So I'd say one thing is to just be very accepting of everything. The, but what I learned from um, the pandemic and having those one on one meetings with students, we scheduled um, weekly meetings with all of our students that were about half an hour long. And um, so we could really dig into where they were and what they needed help with. And as we have these meetings, we, we develop scaffolding. And what what I started to do, and I know, Mary Tess, I learned this from you. <laughs> um, we would like develop a scaffold for a student that seemed to fit what they needed and then share it with everyone and say, here's one way that you might approach this. I think it's, you know, I think it's really important to just continually to say yes to what students are asking. Um, like I, I want them, I want them to feel like any effort is appreciated and any vision of how to do this is it's probably not something I'm going to communicate because I can't, I don't see it. I like, I can't possibly see all the ways that you can explore something. So I, I want to be in the habit of saying yes to what my students are asking for um, and, and be open to the many ways that they approach projects. And I, and know that, like, I want them to know that I don't have all the answers, <laughs> but I can support them. And the other thing, I think is important is to know that there really isn't a deadline. There's a time when we're going to stop. We're going to stop talking about this project every day. We're not going to give you class time to work on it anymore. We're going to ask you to share what you have, but it doesn't mean that your project has to end right now. It, it can continue if this is your passion and maybe you think about where your next steps are. Um, so I don't know if that really answers your question, Sarah. Um, but I, I think we have to be really open. I totally know what you're talking about, about throwing all these templates at them. And it, it does like it, they get overwhelmed. You saw Jack's project, like he didn't have all that stuff, you know, because he couldn't absorb it. But by the end of eighth grade, he did just like out, like it was incredible what he did. And, and so I, I try never to like pass judgment and make them feel like, no, you, you know, this, this is a structure that, that you can use and it's not going to be the one that speaks to you and that's okay. There are other ways to do this. We learned, you know, Screencastify is a great way for students who struggle with writing to just, you know, record yourself talking. Um, so there's, there's just so many different ways that students can, can um, plan and do a, a, a project. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we have any last questions uh, before we give some um, quick announcements and then just uh, gratitude for these amazing educators coming from Highline Big Picture School? Any last questions? Just one quick question. So in yesterday's yeah. communities with K through eight, we were given a, a Google form to fill out. Are you guys part of that same thing? Like, is this something that we're eventually gonna like hopefully meet more often? 
because I do feel like this has been really helpful. I don't have that Google form, but I'm sure Carrie will send it to you. Yes, they will be roped in on all of that. So no worries. <laughs> they can't escape us. Exactly. <laughs> Guys, give some love to Tracy, Denise, and Meritis, please. Uh, round of applause for their wonderful, practical, hands-on um, presentation. That's pretty incredible. Not a lot of pontification more um, around the real work that's happening right now with uh, them and the students. So super appreciative of that. Some quick uh, quick announcements. Um, loved your feedback on this session, y'all. Um, we're always in a place, we're a learning organization. So uh, the link to the feedback form is on there. Dave dropped it about 36 times already. So just in case you missed it the first time, it's there on the chat. Um, something that you should know as well, I just wanted to remind folks, we got um, some really good stuff happening, man. We've got our uh, keynote coming up uh, at 12 o'clock Pacific time, three o'clock Eastern time. Then we've got uh, some really exciting stuff with Chris Jackson here as planned with Encore. And then we've got our after hours, y'all. So uh, we thank you so much for coming to this session and we look forward to seeing you in the other sessions, y'all. Appreciate you. Much love to everybody.